Hello lovely people, as promised, this week I am talking about my 10 best non-fiction books that I read in 2020. Usual disclaimer, these are all books that I read in 2020, they are not all books that were published in 2020, and again, I'm going to be going through these in the order in which I read them because I am incapable of <laughs> just of ranking things. I found compiling this a little bit harder than compiling my fiction books, because with fiction I just went through all of my five star reads and I picked out ten that really stood out to me. For this, I felt like I read a lot of non-fiction books last year that I have that are on like a similar level, so I read a lot of really good non-fiction last year, but I read a lot that I, I, I have similar levels of enthusiasm for, so it was harder to sort of sift through that and um, condense it just down to 10. But I have done it. <laughs> I might edit this and be like, oh, I can't believe I chose this book over this book. But we've pledged our troth and we're just going to go with it now. So the first book I want to talk about is Shout Sister Shout, the untold story of rock and roll trailblazer Sister Rosetta Tharp by Gail Wald. Sister Rosetta Tharp is a musician whose name I was vaguely familiar with, but my friend gifted this to me for my birthday because um, he knows that I like reading um, books that explore women from history who are doing cool things, and that's very much Sister Rosetta Tharp. She was a rock and roll legend, she was hugely influential, but is not always talked about when we talk about rock and roll legends. Um, this is its not a very big book, and I read it very early on in the year, I think I read it in January, and I just had such a great time getting a better understanding of this absolute pioneer of rock music. And I also really enjoyed the exploration of her sexuality because she may or may not have been bisexual and I didn't have any clue about that. And I just think that this really opened my eyes to someone who I think is very cool and very influential who maybe is not talked about as much as they should be. I've been working my way through Maya Angelou's um, autobiographies for a while now and I read three of them uh, in 2020. I've chosen All God's Children Need Travelling Shoes to talk about. I could have included all three in this list, but I think this was the one I liked the most out of the three that I read, so I thought I would just talk about these, but like honourable mention to the whole series, to be honest with you. This follows the portion of her life when she has moved to live in Ghana, and she falls in with this group of people who are largely black Americans, or some of them are black British people, and um, they've come to Africa to sort of find that connection and the realities of that experience. There were ways in which the experience did not live up to what she had expected, and um, they sort of felt a little bit other in this place that they had hoped to have this homecoming in. And then there are other moments in this where she has these moments that are, uh, make her feel so connected, and it really grapples with that um, experience you have when you're a descendant of an enslaved person, when you don't know your history, you don't, she doesn't know where in Africa her roots are, of trying to find connection when that whole history has been stolen from you. She always manages in her autobiographies to tackle these larger topics. Um, and ground them in her real personal lived experience. I feel like every single book in her autobiography series is beautiful. This one in particular stood out to me and I just felt like, I feel like she's masterful in the way that she um, combines both like larger looking at like civil rights in America, looking at um, politics in Ghana, and then like also her own her journey of like finding employment and like her relationship with her son and stuff like this and also her own like grappling with um finding her place and her history and her connection and stuff like this after that are two books that sort of informed each other i read both of these for the asian readathon um the first one is life and death in shanghai by Niang cheng during the cultural revolution in china she was accused of being a british spy because she worked for shell her husband had been very high up in shell uh, he passed away and she continued to work there so during the Cultural Revolution, she was targeted. She was imprisoned in solitary confinement for a very long amount of time. When she did eventually get out of prison, she discovered that her daughter had died and she set out to uh, discover the truth around her daughter's death because it was something that was um, covered up in some ways. This is not an easy read by any means and it tackles a lot of very heavy topics. I came into this knowing the bare minimum about the Cultural Revolution and I feel like she did such a good job of showing just like the larger scene of what is happening but also her, her deeply deeply personal experiences because she was in solitary confinement for a very long time and the ways in which she had to go about attempting to find information, how she survived. 
she was so determined at every point to not give a false confession because once you do a false confession once they can trap you into into anything because you've already lied once and she was innocent so she stuck by her her innocence and the ways that she protested against her treatment and spoke back in these situations that are terrible it was just I think that she is immensely brave woman. I think that she's immensely, um, she's very good at like funneling her anger into doing like, I don't like productivity isn't the right word, but like funneling this anger at her poor treatment and her mistreatment into being able to discover, um, get a sense of what might be going on in the outside world. Um, I also read Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela this year, which could have been in this list. <laughs> And one thing that was really interesting was because they are both um, narratives of people being imprisoned for a long stretch of time, there were a number of similarities in the two about how they got through this time. I just think this is absolutely brilliant. I learned a lot. I feel I felt deeply for her. It was not always an easy read, but I think it's a very worthwhile read. The book that I read after that really fed into the same sort of topic. So this is Wild Swans, Three Daughters of China by Yong Chang. This is sort of like an intergenerational story of Yong Chang's family. So it follows her grandmother, who was a courtesan to a warlord, um, and had her mother in that relationship. It follows her mother, who was very involved in the Communist Party, and then it also tells her own experiences. In some ways it's doing a very similar thing, but from a much different perspective. So again, because you're following so closely like the personal lives of her family, it really roots you in like a grounding point from which she can then explain sort of like the wider picture of politics in China at all of these different times. This book had a very uh, specific focus. This one, because we are following these three generations, really helped give me a bit more understanding of like the bigger picture at times and stuff like that, especially because her family moves around. So, you know, China is so big, um, the experiences will vary in place to place. And because her family moved to different, po different places at different part times, um, it really helps me get a better understanding of like the distinctions between different places and like the different politics and that sort of thing. Similarly, I really appreciated when it was um, Yong Chang's own perspective, um, sort of the the changing understanding she has of the world. So you know, she is someone who's very much brought up um, with parents who are, are a deep part of the Communist Party, and. I had the knowledge of Niang Cheng's experiences in the Cultural Revolution to um, sort of ground myself in, but that's very much the experience of, of an older woman, quite an affluent woman, who was living in a city and then imprisoned, whereas Yong Chang's experiences is a much younger, essentially like a child, a teenager. Um, she moved about in different places and spent a lot of time in the countryside and the evolution she had from completely taking everything that is said as truth to actually because she spends time in different places it exposes to her some of the lies that she's been fed so you know like people in the city were told that the reason that there's not a lot of food is because there are these great disasters in the countryside but when she goes to do this mandatory work in the countryside and she asks them about this big disaster they're just like what are you talking about so it's like these ways in which just a normal girl can suddenly get these little chinks and these little glimpses that everything might not be as she thinks it is. For the sake of being concise, I will leave it there, but there is so much more to say about this. It's a bit of a chunky one, but I sped through it. It's weird to say I enjoyed it because like her family go through such hardships. And again, this is not a tale that is without suffering. I just felt like it was written so well and I feel like it really like succeeds at what it sets out to do and um, I found it immensely illuminating. After that, I want to talk about a book I read on my Kindle and that is The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House by Audrey Lord. This is a collection of um, essays. I think they're based on speeches um, that Audrey Lord gave at various points in her life. For something that is so short, I found it immensely powerful. Um, you can really tell that Audrey Lord is a poet. I feel like the way that she expressed things was just beautifully done. Um, and equally, the things she is expressing are immensely important. In some ways, it's quite sad how relevant a lot of the things she's arguing still are to us now. You would hope that we had uh, at least moved to a point where some of them were not quite so pertinent, but yet they still are. I felt like it was so successful at being both like concise and powerful and showing the ways in which people perpetuate oppression. It, the, the very concept of the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, like um, people who are perpetuating oppression, giving you acceptable ways to like progress and stuff like this, will still in many ways not solve a problem because it's just it makes someone feel better but it doesn't actually necessarily address the root cause of things and stuff like this. I 
Um, because it's a series of essays, like there are so many different topics that I could talk about that it covers, but I think for something that is so small and so little, it just did so much, and I found it immensely powerful. Changing tack completely, we also have This Golden Fleece, A Journey Through Britain's Knitted History by Esther Rutter. I really love those types of books that are sort of part memoir, part exploration of a topic. I particularly enjoyed this because I like wool. <laughs> I enjoy um, sort of textile history as relates to social history, and that's very much what this is. Esther Rutter took a year, and every month that year she um, knitted a different garment. So the chapters are split into the garment that she is exploring, um, but then she's really like delving into the history of that garment. So for example, if she's talking about Gamsey, she's looking at Britain's history with um, uh, sailing and sailing the social experience of the women who would uh, stay home and knit while the men were on sea. Um, again, she, she looks at, um, there's a whole chapter where she looks at like craftivism and like activism that's linked to crafting and stuff like this. She covers a whole breadth of different topics and time periods through this and she's really examining like this relationship and the way that wool was so influential on the development of, of Britain and um, how influential it was in certain areas and stuff like this. and. Um, sort of the way that that's not necessarily the case anymore, or is it? I personally grew up in a place where, like, I know the areas that are like wool towns, like they got their wealth from wool, and it very much influenced the development of the towns. So it's just a topic that I found so interesting. And particularly, um, she does also explore a bit of her own life and history and the connections that she might have to these places or these items and stuff like this. I felt like she didn't do too much of it. Sometimes with these books that are exploring both like personal life and a topic, they can get a little bit too personal life heavy for me. So I felt like this had a really good blend of the two and her personal life experiences were always coming back to this topic at hand rather than maybe like going off on their own accord. So like she finds out that she's pregnant during the writing of this, so she makes an item for her baby and she explores that item, but also it is deeply rooted in this really personal thing. So this was just like a lovely book that I just really enjoyed the reading of. I also want to talk about Dictatorland by Paul Kenyon. I don't know where the book currently is, it's somewhere in the flat that I can't find it, um, but I found this immensely educational. It's looking at a number of African countries, it's split by sort of resource, so it looks at like uh, diamonds, it looks at oil, it looks at uh, cocoa, stuff like this. So it's focusing on a number of different African countries that have all had dictatorships and it's very much looking at the way, first of all, that they were exploited by other countries for those resources, and then the way that these dictators came to power, and the way that their power was also linked to these resources. This was one of those books where I read it, and I learned a whole lot, and then time has passed, and it's one that I continue to think about because it just exposed me to a whole like portion of history that I didn't really know anything about, a better understanding of some of these um, exploitations that have happened. It's fundamentally changed my chocolate consumption for the better, I think. Um, and I just found it immensely eye-opening. It's one that I'm, I'm not sure if when I read it I would have said that it was going to be on my best non-fiction books for 2020 list, but the influence it has had and the way that it has stayed with me and caused me to sort of um, go forward and do more reading and stuff like this, I feel like it deserves to be here. After that is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. This might be my favourite non-fiction book I read last year. I know I said that I was incapable of saying things like that, but I think it might be. Robin Wall Kimmerer is an indigenous writer, she's a member of the Sisters and Potawatomi Nation, and she's also a botanist, and this is really combining both like her indigenous understanding of uh, interaction with the world and stuff like that with this like scientific background that she has and sort of like marrying the two. It's a series of essays and they all explore different topics, and I just found it the most wonderful read she addresses some really important topics in here. She looks at how um, we are destroying ecosystems, but also how we can repair those relationships with ecosystems. She is not afraid to tackle concepts to do with climate change in a way that I found really immensely like pr productive in some ways, because she's it, it's facing up to where we're at, but it's also exploring ways in which we can fix this, but we can't fix it if we never look at it, if we never address it, if we never apologize for it. 
Um, that's just like one side. There's also these beautiful essays about like, why do these two plants look so beautiful together? Turns out it's because they get more action from the bees if they're together, because they complement each other so well. Like, um, science but matched with like beauty and um, wisdom and I just I just everything about this was so wonderful I have her book Gathering Moss to read this year I just think she was wonderful this is a book that I will return to time and time again I've turned down corners of my favorite essays that I want to reread um, particularly soon and I just thought it was wonderful there's a reason everyone raves about this because it's brilliant after that is Sea People by Christina Thompson in search of the ancient navigators of the Pacific this is looking at um, Polynesia and it's, it's kind of tracing like our understanding of Polynesian history. So it begins with um, these interactions between Polynesians and Europeans um, and it's sort of tracing the, the understanding we have of Polynesian history like through time. So she's not just telling you Polynesian history, she's, she's sort of walking you through the way that ideas developed, the way that um, there we tried to test these with like science and like what was effective what was not effective what are ideas we had that we've now disproved I really enjoyed the sections to do with experimental voyaging because as you might expect from a book that sort of like takes its start point from like um, Europeans interacting with Polynesian people you know there's a real focus on like colonialism a lot of these theories um, are pretty much just racist because they're like oh surely these people were not intelligent enough to voyage across all of these islands deliberately and then when you reach this experimental voyaging chapters and stuff it's like yes very much so just because Europeans can't do it doesn't mean that other people couldn't and I just found all of that like experimental voyaging just like so fascinating and interesting um, so I really enjoyed this. I thought it was um, really well put together. I had a really interesting time reading it. I definitely want to go forward and um, do some more reading about like individual places in Polynesia. This is a very like broad overview look and I would like to like focus my reading on some more individual places but um, it was definitely a really interesting start to reading about Polynesia. The final book I want to talk about is one that I maybe would not have predicted would be on this list when I first started it, but I ended up having a really... it gave me so much, so many thoughts. Um, this is The World Turned Upside Down, Radical Ideas During the English Revolution by Christopher Hill. This is looking at sort of like specifically like the 1640s, 1650s in England, this sort of time between post-Civil War, um, where Protestantism is really like sort of finding itself and you have all of these like radical movements like levelers like diggers like ranters like quakers um and it's this real like time of like radical ideas being explored um because to, to achieve the civil war um parliament sort of had to um mobilize the common man they used all this rhetoric to sort of like mobilize the common man but then after they had achieved the outcome this rhetoric was sort of like still present and all of these people were having all of these like really radical thoughts and ideas to do with one's relationship with god like how does hell work how does sin work how do all of these different topics to do with radically rethinking um individual relationships with the divine and i found it so interesting there's a l whole bunch of ideas here which you might associate with like the 60s free love movement of like running around with no clothes on having a lot of sex that sort of thing which were present in here like the 1640s and stuff and it was just a, sort of this reminder that these ideas that you think are like individual to like particular eras might actually have their roots further back um i don't know i just I, this is a book that I would recommend going into with a little bit of background knowledge if only like on the time period and that sort of thing because he's not really giving explanations of like what are the levelers he's sort of like assuming that you know like a little bit and he's exploring different topics in different chapters um, because all of these movements feed into each other and especially and some of these types some of these names we give them are like imposed from a distance by historians from like observing behaviors and common threads that tie people together and stuff like this so it's very much like this history that like all of these groups are feeding into each other there are things which distinguish some groups from others but i just found this concept of like of like radically thinking about ideas and about like what does it mean to 
engage with the divine. I don't know. I'm not religious. I just found this absolutely fascinating from like a an a idea and concept point of view. So um, it's another book that's ended up staying with me more than I think I expected it to. Um, that's it. Those are all the books I wanted to talk about in this video. There are a whole bunch of books that I also could have mentioned. I found this really hard to condense. I would love to hear what your best non-fiction books were of 2020. I am always on the hunt for more. About a quarter of my reading last year was non-fiction, which I think is a really good amount. Part of me is tempted to try and make 2021 like a little bit more, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I do have some really fantastic books lined up for this year, so I'm, I might make this a recurring thing. I've never really done it before, but um, do let me know if you'd like me to do it on an ongoing basis. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of these books or any of your non-fiction reads of last year. Otherwise, I hope you're having a really lovely day. I will see you next time for something different.